Hashes are mysterious little beasts that we use every single day but might not fully understand. Is it important that we understand how a hashes work? Well, not really, but it is interesting, especially if you're a five-year-old programmer, which is apparently the case with Kevin Naughton, who inspired this video. He wants to know why hashes are irreversible, but with the constraint that I need to treat him like a five-year-old. Challenge accepted, Kev. Can I call you Kev? If I was five and asked my parents why hashes aren't reversible, this is likely what they would tell me. And I would think it a reasonable as well as expected answer. I'll assume that you all want a better explanation though, but I will say I hope you've paid attention in your first grade math class. <laughs> I'll assume you're a prodigy. Why not? That wasn't in the rules, was it? Alright, let's imagine that your entire fifth grade class is going on a field trip to Disneyland. Cool school. You're going to have a lot of fun, but your parents and teachers are worried that one of you might try to ditch the bus so you could live at Disneyland, kind of like I tried to do <laughs> so many years ago. There are a lot of kids at your school, too, and that makes counting everyone extremely time-consuming and ripe for mistakes. But one of the teachers is a burnt-out computer programmer who hated their life and decided to do something more meaningful. Their first step was to sort the group by age, and then divide the group evenly into smaller groups of eight, still sorted by age. Each group of kids would walk through the special gate one kid at a time when they left the school, and this gate has one job, to figure out if the day of the month the kid was born on is either even or odd. If you're five and don't know what even or odd means, pretend you live somewhere other than the United States where they actually teach math in school. Inside this machine is a special gear that turns once for every kid going through who was born on an odd day of the month. For even kids, the counter turns twice. Woohoo! Go evens. This gear is attached to a bunch of special dials inside the machine, all different sizes, that all turn in super special ways. Some of these dials only track letters, some track numbers, and other dials track both. It's really complicated in there. When every kid has walked through the gates, the super special numbers and letters created by the gears in each machine would be read and smashed together, which gives our very clever teacher a weird looking code, which is called a hash. This hash is extremely useful because, you see, when the day is done and it's time to come home, you sort every kid just like before you left and make them walk through the gates again. And yes, in case you're wondering, Disneyland has the exact same gates. My, uh. Assuming no one got lost, the machine should create the exact same special code as the gates back at school. Now, if that didn't happen, someone's busted. <laughs> we'll assume they're not lost, just trying to stay a little bit longer. And that, dear class, is why hashes aren't reversible. Well, basically. For the non-five-year-olds out there, let's dig in just a little bit more. The spinning dial in our special gate story is an algorithm that every hash has, and it's called compression. Compression performs a one-way calculation using modular math, which I'll get into in a second, but just know that it's impossible to reverse calculations performed in this way. Now, for example, let's say you knew that this clock right here used to say 10 a.m. before I spun the dials around some number of times. Given the result and the starting value, can you reverse engineer and figure out how many times I spun the dials on the clock? Now, it's tempting to say, well, you spun the hands amounting to 2 hours and 20 minutes, but that's not correct. That's a guess. It's not a calculation. The math behind this is called modular math, and you've likely used it before when working with remainders, which is what I'm doing here in JavaScript. The percent sign is called the remainder operator, which most people just refer to as mod, and that's actually a mistake. You see, different languages treat the mod operator differently, or I should say the percent operator. On the left side there is C sharp, which deals with negative mod operations differently than Ruby, which is in the middle. JavaScript agrees with C-sharp, and it's really annoying. What does your favorite language do? Why does it even matter? Well, it matters because it can cause some crazy bugs if you're expecting a negative mod operation to return the right number. Now, what is that right number? Well, you can read more about it on my blog if you like. I'll leave a link in the description below. I dive into this and a lot more. All right, back to hashing algorithms. If we're using SHA-256, that means we're going to end up with a 256-bit hash. To get that 256 bits, we need to use eight separate one-way compression functions, which produce 32-bit values apiece. These 32-bit values are then turned into hex and smashed together, and boom, we have a hash that is not reversible. Now, again, there are ways to guess what the hash represents, but there's no way to reverse calculate it. Whatever hashing algorithm we use, however, it has to create the exact same value every time 
for the same binary value. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. The hash of your name using SHA-256, for example, has to be the same no matter what machine is doing it. And there are other rules too, but this is the most important one. Hashes should be theoretically unique for every binary value they're used with. This means they can act as a form of identity, or a signature if you will. There are some cases, however, where different binary values yield the exact same hash, and these are called collisions and are very bad indeed. MD5, for instance, has been shown to produce collisions. One extremely useful use of a hash is to create what's called a checksum using something like SHA-256. You do this before you download and then send the checksum along with a file. When the client finishes downloading the file, it's hashed once again. And if everything went right, the downloaded checksums should match exactly. That would mean, one, the file wasn't replaced, and two, there was no corruption. Our special gates produced a checksum for our five-year-olds going to Disneyland, thanks to our burned-out programmer teacher. <laughs> Yay, programming! Now, at this point, you should have a load of questions, and I could fill an hour-long video trying to answer them, or you could just head over to bigmachine.io, link in the description, and buy my damn book, where I go into all this stuff and a lot more. I also have a groovy blog and newsletter where I write all kinds of fun things about computer science, getting over imposter syndrome, and yes, hashing algorithms. Again, here's another one. Here's a video I did a few months ago, and I'll put a link to that in the description. All right, Kev buddy, not quite like you were five, but hopefully you found this helpful. Now go outside and play with your friends. Stop bothering me. <laughs>